Thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, hi, folks. Uh, as um, as introduced, I'm Elfie Colodangelo of uh, Kent State University, and I'm here on behalf of my colleagues, uh, Lynn Ransom from the Schoenberg Institute for Manuscript Studies at Penn Libraries and Doug Emery at Penn Libraries, um, who are both also involved in the Digital Scriptorium 2.0 project. Um, Lynn is our uh, project director, and Doug is our technical consultant and um, general uh, jack of all trades when it comes to um, getting us off the ground or in terms of our uh, wiki base, which I will talk about. So um, my plan for today's talk is to give you a little bit of background about Digital Scriptorium as an entity and then talk about the redevelopment, specifically uh, alerting you to some of the concerns we have regarding the special nature of manuscript metadata and also the limitations of the previous database. I'm also gonna give you a bird's eye view of our data model that was uh, developed during the early stages of this project, um, and then show you in more detail about how our workflows uh, fit into that data model, and then some of the decisions we made in terms of um, representing the data as linked open data, and that included some uh, steps that we took for semantic enrichment. And then finally, I'll um, conclude by kind of telling you a little bit about what we plan for the future. So um, let's get started. So first, let me explain what Digital Scriptorium is. It's a, a consortium of, um, of individual libraries, museums, other cultural heritage institutions, uh, approximately over 40 of them, that have all come together um, in order to aggregate their metadata and to combine um, all of their metadata about pre their pre-modern manuscripts that they own in one single user interface. Now, um, the Digital Scriptorium Consortium um, founded, uh, you know, in, in previous years on this notion of developing a national union catalog. And so they, uh, the goal was to aggregate all of their metadata about their manuscripts that they owned in U.S. collections and to be able to search across all of that metadata. And over time, um, as I'll discuss, there were some limitations to, to how that worked. So at some point um, in the past few years, there was a need really to redevelop. And part of that redevelopment was really modernizing the National Union Catalog to focus more on uh, how the metadata would be structured to, uh, to be optimized for a linked data environment. So let me talk a little bit about um, essentially what manuscripts are and how we have to represent them uh, effectively in terms of this environment. So um, we have to think of manuscripts not just as sort of bibliographic materials, although they, they are in some ways, but really also they're unique objects. And so that requires a description of not just their contents, sort of, you know, what is in them, what the subject, what the textual uh, contents are, but also their physical properties, what they're made of, what their dimensions are. And in addition, a really important component is the context around which they were created and their provenance. In other words, the chain of folks or institutions that, um, that owned them or sold them or traded them. Um, additionally, knowledge about manuscripts um, can be really thin, can be really disparate and debated. And this requires extensive scholarship on the part of manuscript scholars and uh, revisions can occur in the descriptions as more is learned. So um, there might be elements in a metadata record that were you know, common, commonly accepted for a long period of time and the new scholarship changes those assumptions. In addition, um, many libraries use manuscripts, uh, use bibliographic standards to describe their manuscripts, but there's no uh, uniformly agreed upon standard. And so this can present a barrier for institutions, and that includes some institutions in our consortium, which um, just lack the expertise and resources to implement bibliographic description records. So they might be poised to have these manuscripts and they want to create solid, say, mark records, but they just can't because they don't have the, the staffing or the resources or the time to be able to do it. So let me give you a, a view of what the old um, database looked like. So essentially it was that institutions had this metadata, this information, and it could have been formal records or it could have been finding aids or it could have been any number of uh, you know, descriptive information that they had. 
And what they were required to do was, in addition to housing their institutional records, they had to manually input information into this rather complicated spreadsheet. And it was based on a METS schema. And so they would have to uh, put the information into the, into the spreadsheet, and then that would be uploaded to a digital scriptorium database, which was METS-based data. And, um, and essentially what happened was, was that they'd have to maintain two sets of metadata records. And so this was often labor intensive and error prone. You can see how there would be drift over time between institutional information and what was in the digital scriptorium database. And often the digital scriptorium database was um, you know, the second priority and that, that information might not be updated. In addition, um, there were the MetSpace data made it limited in terms of browsing and searching, and the data just wasn't optimized for linked data applications. So as part of the redevelopment, um, we were guided by certain principles that you hopefully will see um, laid out in terms of uh, how we both created the data model and then implemented it. So the first is that, um, again, to, to keep it, to keep consortium members um, committed to to contributing their data to to this DS 2.0 redevelopment, we wanted to keep minimal uh, data entry standards. To a, we wanted to keep data entry standards to a minimum, and what that meant was all we really needed was to know that that an institution owned a manuscript and then assigned it some kind of shelf mark or ID. That is actually all the, the metadata that we need. Any other additional descriptive metadata is simply gravy. We also uh, wanted to make it clear that members will manage their own metadata. So that includes metadata formats and values. We use what is provided from them. We ingest what, they, what records they have or what, what metadata they have, and we don't correct or add to it, with an exception that I will talk about in just a moment. Additionally, the old database hosted images, but this became prohibitive um, in part of cost and time. Um, but if folks do have uh, IIIF manifests, we, we were able to use those URIs and to integrate them with the rest of the metadata. So here's the part that we add to. So DS 2.0 uh, does provide semantic enrichment. So when metadata is contributed to us, we enhance that metadata where possible by reconciling values to external linked data authorities. Uh, in addition, and, and the way that we do that is um, by creating linkages between the metadata records, our internal um, uh, authorities, and then linking those authorities out into the, um, into the LOD environment. And then ultimately, uh, what we promote is open access. So DS 2.0 data, um, is open and available for reuse. And I'll, I'll point out a couple of places where you can actually um, uh, observe that in terms of our repositories. So let me talk a little bit about uh, an overview of the data model um, and then how, and then you'll see how that, um, how that, that manuscript metadata is structured and then um, in terms of mapping it to the, to the data model. So, our data model is built on um, essentially a backbone of three classes of entities. First, there's the actual physical manuscript, and that's the, the actual physical object in the real world. Next is the DS 2.0 record, and that's the metadata description. That's all the data that we're ingesting from, uh, from member institutions. And then the holding information is connected to the manuscript, which is a, a metadata description um, of the institution that holds the, the the manuscript um, and the, the date information in terms of their holdings. So right now we would just be looking at current holdings, but if holding information should ever change, in other words, if a manuscript should change hands, then we would uh, be able to see, uh, be, able, be able to track that over time. Now, I think an important part of the data model is that it separates the physical object from its catalog record. So, um, so rather than having the, the metadata record stand in for the manuscript, we assign the manuscript um, a, a DSID. So this is a unique and persistent identifier that um, will not change. And that, I, and that accords with the physical manuscript in the real world. What we then do is we connect it to, a, to the metadata description that we get from the institutions, and that is revised or overwritten as there's changes in, in, 
in metadata descriptions by say the institution, say there's more scholarship. And so really what we're, what, the way we're conceptualizing this is that the DS record, uh, 2.0 record, the metadata record is basically a cataloger's observation of a manuscript object at a particular point in time. And what we're doing is presenting the most current observation that's available. So you'll see here, um, this is very small to, and hard to read, but I just wanna point out the backbone. So here's the metadata record, and you'll see it's connected here as that it describes a particular manuscript, which is given a DSID. And then here's the holding information that accords with this physical manuscript. The rest of what I'm gonna talk about is essentially how we implemented all of the semantic enrichment for, um, for the rest of these entities. So um, that includes the, you know, uh, things like languages, places, names, genres, and subjects. Uh, so this is how, um, so I should mention that, um, so the data model was developed and then um, sort of independently of any kind of particular application. And it was looking at a number of things like our, from our guiding principles, which included that we wanted to have um, more inclusive practices, have it easier for folks to be able to, to, um, to be able to contribute their metadata, including just limited amounts of metadata. We wanted to, um, to change the, the context in terms of pre-modern manuscripts, um, not just from a European perspective, from, 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 from global manuscript cultures. So we were looking at really widening the temporal and spatial scope of the project. Um, we also wanted to represent this as linked data. So, um, so, we, so we first thought about what kind of data would we have available to us? And so that, you know, means a number of different formats and, and things like that, um, that may accord with different kinds of standards. And then how do we integrate them all together? So this was, so the data model was developed and then um, the choice was made to be able to, um, to implement that data, data model in Wikibase. And so what you see here is basically the, the streamlined um, uh, elements and properties of the data model that accord with where it says items, these are our, our types. So you'll see the, the backbone that I mentioned, manuscript holding DS 2.0 record, and then a number of our authority types and other, um, and other types of entities. And then on the right-hand side, you'll see um, the properties that we have that connect all of those entities in our data model. So the data model as implemented, again, here's this backbone. And then again, although it's um, probably difficult for you to see, what you're actually seeing here is relationships between, so the metadata record that has a name mentioned, or has a, yes, has a name mentioned. And then you'll see that it the, the, the name that occurs in the metadata record is then connected to an authority file within uh, our, what is, with, within our wiki base and then that wiki base is then that wiki base item is then connected to an external authority so let me talk a little bit about um, how the data model works into our workflow and then you'll you'll see a couple of screenshots of how this is implemented in wikibase so again the goal is to have um, members structured data into um, aggregated and integrated uh, in in our ds 2.0 redevelopment so we take member structured data in whatever form it's in, and that means um, it's coming in a number of metadata formats that we then map to our data model. And then we put that in what we call an agnostic spreadsheet. So it's it's simply the, all of the data that's, um, that's aggregated, mapped to our data model, and then put in a CSV file. That CSV file is then segmented into particular uh, metadata elements. So we'll take all the names, the places, the genres, et cetera, and we'll put that in OpenRefine. And then we use reconciliation services that are available through OpenRefine to align those string values to their um, counterparts in linked open vocabularies or other uh, linked open data hubs. We take that semantically enriched data, we recombine it, and then that spreadsheet is then used to upload to our wiki base. So all of the data that's in the, the CSV file um, then gets pushed to uh, our, our wiki base instance, and then the wiki base instance would be available to the public. 
So here's a, a little bit of what the Wikibase instance looks like. So this is actually the start of a DS 2.0 record. This is the, the DS ID is the, the manuscript item that it's that this is connected to. And then you'll see some of the descriptive metadata here. You'll see that it looks very similar to Wikidata. Wikibase and Wikidata are built on the, the same type of software. So you'll see metadata statements here. Um, so this this is where the linked data becomes important, right? This is the, the subject, predicate, and object relationships. So for this particular entity, we would have an associated name, and then we would see the name Peter Lombard. That's the string value. And the way that we represent the string value as linked data to the external authorities is by a qualifier property. So this name of name and authority file property value um, gets connected to Peter Lombard. This is the value in our um, in our authority. And this authority then is connected to the Wikidata item for Peter Lombard. So um, we've made a couple of decisions in terms of the LOD vocabularies that we use for this um, semantic enrichment. And um, we've used um, AAT for centuries and materials. We've used Wikidata for languages, people, and organizations, TGN for uh, places, and um, terms which we've um, combined for our purposes, uh, that means subject and genre terms. Um, we've used a, a number of different vocabularies, and that can be dependent on um, what vocabularies were used by the by the home institution. So if they indicate that they used AAT, we align with AAT. If they used an, an LC-derived vocabulary, we use FAST, etc. Now, the, the guiding choices that we used for these semantic enrichment alignments um, were a, sort of to, to um, limit the interpretation of the data, but also to be able to leverage um, the linked open data environment. So uh, first, we only considered vocabularies that were published as linked open data. So that means if an institution used a vocabulary that wasn't represented as linked open data, we simply leave those values unreconciled. Also, if we can't find those values in a, in a linked open data vocabulary, then we simply don't uh, align it. We leave it as a string value that's unqualified. Uh, we Again, we only match where appropriate. So um, we have to know the, the source for, um, for, for where the, the term came from. We use vocabularies known to GLAM communities. So for instance, uh, places were not specifically identified um, other than uh, the, the source for, the, for places wasn't identified, but we knew that TGN would have all of the geographic and historical coverage we needed. Uh, we wanted to leverage the value in data and flexibility of linked data. Um, so in some cases that meant that um, we might use an unconventional choice like uh, wiki data for languages. Um, because we were able then to, if we link to Wikidata, we can then link to any number of ISO codes or other external authorities. Um, we want to address limitations in existing authorities. So again, uh, Wikidata was sometimes better than using a Library of Congress uh, name authority file. Um, this is due to the fact that a number of the names that we, that we have in our data are not found in traditional linked data authorities. They're, um, they might be um, they might be rare instances of say collectors of manuscripts or scribes that are just not found anywhere else. And so um, finally, we wanted to make sure that we had a manageable process. So um, all of the linked data uh, vocabularies that we used were available ultimately as reconciliation services through OpenRefine. So um, you can actually view our documentation at uh, at, at our GitHub. So github.com slash digital scriptorium. And I'll highlight that um, we actually publish our metadata repositories for these reconciled values. So these, these are the values that are going ultimately into a single CSV file that are aggregated and then pushed into our wiki base. So again, it's very small here, but you'll see these are the string values that came from our data. These are the um, structured names as they're found in TGN. And then these are the URIs that represent those spatial uh, place concepts. Here's one for genres. So you'll see here, the, I, the reason I highlighted this is because we not only have the terms, but we also have the vocabularies from whence they came. And then here's the labels as they appear in the uh, authoritatively, the preferred terms in the, um, in the uh, 
vocabulary, and then here are the URLs or URIs for those. So again, the way this 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 works, the way that the the linked data relationships work, is that we have an an entity, an item, say the the DS two point record, and then it's this property of genre as recorded shows us the um, the the string value that's representative in the the metadata uh, record, and then we see that it can be linked to any number of uh, qualified by any number of authority values. So our next steps are to um, move from our prototype, which you've seen here in screenshots, to our beta version. That'll be the public version. And um, the way we're going to do this is by taking existing METS data and, and then member data uh, in, other, um, in other formats. Um, we're also working simultaneously on the development of a user interface, so a more traditional catalog that's going to then take the linked data that's available in the wiki base, um, flatten the data model, and then uh, be able to have a more traditional uh, user experience. And then we're continuing to analyze our data quality, um, in especially in terms of those semantic enrichment alignments. And then finally, um, our goal is to provide example Sparkle queries to folks so they can they know how to use our wiki base and to provide workshops to uh, manuscript scholars so that they, they have um, more uh, experience um, with our wiki base so that they can do computational research and, and advance other other kinds of digital humanities research. And I really thank you for your time and your attention and I'm happy to take questions. Yes, thank you very much, LP. Uh, now questions can be put into the uh, MetaMorose Town Hall chat. We already have received some and uh, one of the first of this is uh, by Regina. Uh, is the data model published somewhere? And he, she adds, um, does the data model allow for conflicting statements to coexist, reflecting diverging uh, options or opinions or states of research? So um, the the data model as a visual may be up on our website. And if it is not, um, I'll, I have to talk to my colleagues and see if that's something we could put up on the website, but you're welcome. Um, uh, I think we can somehow send it on an individual basis or, or something like that. And I know it will be published eventually in, in terms of academic research. Um, in terms of conflicting statements, um, so, we're not really representing conflicts and diverging opinions because we're only representing the, the manuscript record that's, that is given to us by the institution. So in terms of looking at that as a, a single catalogers observation, um, we're sort of respecting the, the, the owning institution and their, and their uh, cataloging practices in representing that. That isn't to say that at some point you couldn't potentially have more than one DS 2.0 record, but right now that's not the way that our data model works. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, skip, I skip one question and uh, uh, go to the next one. Have you considered to use the IIIF uh, change discovery API to aggregate IIIF compliant resources? Um, I'm not, I'll say I'm not familiar with it, so I'm glad to be introduced to it. I will say that um, the goal of the IIIF manifest is to be able to, where they are available, to be able to display them in our user interface and um, make them available through the wiki base. Um, I think that's an element that we're still sort of working through in terms of what that looks like. Uh, another question by uh, Tina, uh, you mentioned open refine is used uh, to reconcile with authority records. Is this done manually or do you have some kind of automatic workflow that integrates open refine? It's a combination of both. So um, if you go to our GitHub, there's actually a, an open refine uh, repository. And in that are the instructions for um, how to take the, um, the CSV files that are extracted from the member metadata 
you put them in open refine and there's a series of json steps that are documented in the github that you could um, if you had access to those files you could then uh, recreate our process um, most of it is automated and but it does depend on how good the reconciliation service is in terms of um, you know, for instance, uh, automatically reconciling entities. In a lot of, in in some cases, we've had to do some human oversight and and manually, you know, say yes, this is the the correct entity, or no, you picked the wrong one, and here's the right one. Um, but we we retain all that information, um, not just in the JSON code that um, is. So every time that we go through the reconciliation process, we improve our matches. Um, but in addition to that, once a match is made and it's pushed to our metadata repository, we never have to make that change again if we don't need to, um, because every time the data is pulled from member records, it's checked against our metadata repositories. And then um, if, if a name should reoccur in somebody else's data, it would automatically be, um, be semantically enriched. Thanks. Uh... A last question we can take here uh, is by Violetta. Uh, which ontology do you use for the roles? We have a very small um, number of roles. So I think you're talking about the, the, the names have roles. Um, so there's really only four. So it's just a, a, a controlled list of uh, author, scribe, um, artist, and former owner. 